At the police station, all was quiet until a small boy stormed in and yelled, Please, arrest my father. Little did anyone know that his appeal was hiding a secret that would rock everyone to their very core. The small village of St. John's police station was calm on a scorching Tuesday morning. As the cops sipped their coffee and went over reports, the fans turned slowly in an effort to cool down. A normally peaceful morning in the town was shattered as the police station's doors swung wide. As if on the hunt for something or someone, a small child with black hair and terrified eyes hurriedly entered the room. Henry, a little boy of six years old, was obviously afraid. His little feet tapped against the porcelain floor when he confidently made his way to the reception counter. He was so little that he was clinging to the counter hard while he begged an adult to aid him. Everyone in the room listened as his shaking, beseeching voice pleaded for the arrest of his father. At first startled, the officers looked at each other in bewilderment, while some set down their papers, others placed down their coffee cups. An immediate uproar ensued as a result of the statement. Please, take him into custody, Henry pleaded with the police once more. His expression one of extreme distress. His freedom is in jeopardy. Upon hearing the boy's cries, Officer Mary, a young, kind-hearted policewoman, came rushing out of her office. She scooped up Henry and carried him to a bench nearby with a motherly expression on her face. Just relax, just relax, with a stoop to his level. She beckoned him to come sit down. Everything is okay right now. My darling, you're safe here, she whispered as she ran her fingers over his hair to reassure him. Henry's small heart was racing. His shoulders were trembling, and tears started to fall from his eyes. What happened, darling? The policewoman asked him again, her voice kind and caring. No need to shed tears, you're in a secure place now. Are you interested in detailing what transpired? Her reassuring words failed to reach the terrified kid, with his eyes still wide and teary. He gripped to Mary's clothing. The police station's corridor was suddenly teeming with uncertainty mixed with concern. Whispering, what has that boy's father done? The cops exchanged troubled looks. Henry's comments clearly held a weight too great for someone his age, still down beside him. Officer Mary tenderly wiped away his tears and tried once more to console him. Come on, darling, she whispered, take a deep breath, rising from his desk. Sergeant Paul, a big guy with gray hair and a well-kept beard, stood as he made his way over to them in an effort to grasp the circumstances. His eyes were sharp but also little concerned. Good morning, young guy, why are you here alone? Why did you visit this site? The young lad's breathing was labored, broken by cries that clearly expressed his pain. He looked defenseless and terrified even surrounded by protectors. More cops were gathering around Henry gradually, creating a semi-circle. The sergeant asked, Come on, buddy, you can tell us what happened, clearly showing compassion even with his commanding presence. Henry tried to reply, but his words came out slurred and unclear. He ought to be taken under arrest. He stammered, then said, He's going to go to jail, which just made everyone else more anxious. The police decided to relocate the small child to the interrogation room seeing the increasing audience and the possibility of frightening him farther. Mary murmured, Come on, sweetheart, gently raising him, let's go inside and have a chat. As they walked to a more private area, the youngster started to cool off. Officer Mary inquired once more, What did your father do? When Henry sat down in the interrogation room chair. Was he harmful to you or did he act negatively? Mary was trying to get the terrified youngster to provide specific information. Henry's face twisted with frustration, he obviously wanted to say something. But the words seemed to escape him. Daddy gets angry sometimes, he said, his voice faltering at the end of the statement and generating questions and conjecture. Son, what do you mean? asked the sergeant. There was a tangible sense of anxiety in the room as the office's minds raced to solve this enigmatic problem. They wondered what could be so horrible that a youngster would seek sanctuary in the police station and beg for his father's arrest. Conjuring up the worst case scenarios of verbal abuse and domestic violence. As Henry talked about his father, the sergeant bent over and saw the sorrowful expression on his face. We'll help you, Henry, 
He whispered quietly when he stood at the child's eye level. But would you perhaps attempt to provide us with further information? Henry nodded slowly, still fighting to contain his tears. Paul said, Come on, I'll ask you a few questions. You just answer, yes, or, no. Is your dad at home right now? What was your method of leaving the house? Inquired the sergeant. After wiping away his tears, Henry said, Well, daddy's asleep. I hurried here after unlocking the door. Mary and the sergeant concentrated on deciphering Henry's jumbled story. Mary questioned Henry in a maternal manner, saying, Is your father really aggressive? Does he strike you? The young boy answered slowly, as though he was considering what to say. With his eyes wide and breathing quickly, he admitted, Yes, I've been hit a few times. Tension became even more when the officers responded practically instantly. When they asked Henry where he lived, he provided them with directions even though he didn't know the precise address. The officers found Henry's house with the help of the directions he gave them. The residence was reasonably easy to identify because the youngster and his father lived close by. Not far from the sewer, Henry said he hadn't seen his mother in a while when the sergeant inquired about her. Henry said, Dad said she went for a walk, but she never came back. Everyone in the room gasped at these remarks. The likelihood that family violence was involved increased as the circumstances became more apparent. A dad raising a child by himself and saying the mother had just gone for a walk was not common. As police officials hurriedly coordinated their activities and got ready to act, the police station was a hive of activity. As soon as possible, a crew was sent to Henry's house to prepare for the worst. As soon as possible, the sergeant connected with the crew by radio. We have a 35R code for domestic violence. Attention unit. Write a report. Keep the man from getting away. Proceed with caution. Each night he becomes furious, Henry continued, his voice quivering. I just can't take it anymore, he says, looking anxiously at each other. The cops tried to decipher the boy's message. What is it that your father can't take anymore? Kid? The sergeant inquired. Tears started to form in Henry's eyes, slammed the door of the refrigerator. In a fit of terror, he sprinted to his room and screamed. Everyone there saw that the man needed to be arrested. He was a violent man who had attacked the youngster. When the suspect finally showed up at the police station, everyone was on the edge of their seats. At the same time, Henry's dad, Roger, was sound asleep in his bedroom at their house. A depressing scene greeted him when the sound of approaching police cruisers roused him from his slumber. Cops were appalled by what they saw, a crumbling wooden house, spider webs all over the place, and frighteningly overgrown shrubs. The officers rushed through the front door without a word of hesitation. Yelling, police, show your true colors, Roger was swiftly handcuffed and escorted to the car by the police officers leaving him little opportunity to object. I don't understand. What gives? Why is the law enforcement taking my liberty away? Shocked, he let out a yell. It is your right to be quiet if you so desire. In a court of law, whatever you say can and will be utilized against you. You are entitled to legal representation. A public defender will represent you in the event that you are unable to pay for one. Are you familiar with these privileges? Officer here will be transporting you to the station. He or she said, Roger was taken aback by the words, police station. No way, I had no involvement whatsoever. Set me free, my home is occupied by a child. I beg you, please, let me go, he fought. Your son Henry is at the police station. The cops replied curtly when they further restrained him. My friend, you're toast, arranged to be driven. Stunned, Roger was shoved into the car. My son isn't working there. What is he doing? Just tell me. As he started to lose control, panic struck. They got in the car and drove away after the officer told him to remain quiet. Worry in a racing heart plagued Roger. The squad had returned from Henry's residence. As the rumble of the vehicle's engine greeted them at the police station, everyone on the police force was on edge as they waited for word. Unexpectedly, the scene unfolded as soon as the door swung open. A skinny, unwashed man stepped out of the vehicle. The accusations that he could have hurt his son stood in sharp contrast to his pale skin. Deep, weary eyes, 
and muscles that appeared nearly atrophying from apparent starvation. People were silently wondering how the man could have mustered the strength to harm the boy. Given his appearance, still under custody, Roger looked both perplexed and hopeless. What's happening here? Why am I here? He asked, his voice shaking with doubt and anxiety. When his eyes met Henry's at last, he felt a flood of relief and more intense worry. Seeing his father in this condition, the lad behaved unexpectedly, screaming, Daddy. He sprint across the room and flung himself into his father's arms. Tears were wet in his eyes. Tears welled up in both of their eyes when the scene made the cops obviously uncomfortable. The emotional hug, I thought he was abusing the lad, remarked Sergeant, walking toward Officer Marion, who looked shocked, still adjusting to the circumstances. Roger said, what abuse, you mean what, why am I here handcuffed and why is my son at the police station? Everyone turned around in search of solutions. The small boy's faint, naive voice then sliced through the quiet, with hopeful eyes toward Roger. Henry added, I'm the one who had you arrested. Daddy, what, you had me taken under arrest. Nevertheless, why, what had I done? Roger asked, heart thumping wildly, looking from his son to the police agents. He clearly seemed perplexed as he tried to understand the circumstances. Previously tense and confusing, the police station was silent now, still not sure why he was shackled or why his son had done this. Roger spoke once again, his eyes filled with grief and concern. Henry, son, what do you mean I had you jailed? Why would you undertake that? Fighting back tears and with a lump in his throat, the small youngster gazed up his father. Emotionally charged, he added, I just wanted you to eat. Daddy his voice just above a whisper. The straightforward admission dropped into the room like a bomb, disoriented and unable to understand the weight of what had just been shown. Everyone gazed at the sight, his voice faltering. He went on, Dad, I watched it on TV today. It was said that prisoners are fed three times a day. The boy's face was completely covered with tears. I recall hearing you weep that evening, feeling dejected. You were in the kitchen inquiring why there was no food when the refrigerator was open. You yelled and pounded on the fridge. As everyone took in the knowledge, the room became silent, overwhelmed by the seriousness of the situation. Roger started to clarify things by explaining what was going on. As it turned out, the arrest had been the desperate last resort of a destitute father who put his son's needs before of his own. It was evidence of his steadfast love, since his wife passed away. Roger has been raising Henry by himself. He never imagined that telling Henry his mother had gone for a walk would lead Henry to hope that she may return one day. But he did so to shield the youngster from the painful reality. In addition, Roger had serious financial problems as a result of his lack of schooling in months of unemployment. He scarcely ate for himself and was more and more undernourished as he bought enough food for one and gave it all to his son. Henry could see his father's health failing. After Henry had gone to bed one evening, Roger was overcome with despair. He turned to face the empty refrigerator and let out all of his wrath by pounding on the door and yelling. Why? Why is there food missing? How come I can't feed us? Henry was terrified and shocked by the sounds. So he fled back to his room. Henry realized something was seriously wrong even though he was only a young child and could feel his father's anguish. The young child went to watch his cartoon on TV after he went hungry that day. The local newspaper continued to run, carrying reports about the conditions within the prison. When Henry learned that inmates were fed three times a day, he naively believed that getting his father incarcerated would solve their issue. He hurried to the police station to have his father arrested, thinking that once he was in prison, regular meals would be given. Tears streamed down his pale cheeks revealing the pain of his wrong solution. Roger took his son in his arms and held him tenderly. Oh, my little boy, my son, I'm so sorry you had to go through this, said the father. A knot formed in the throats of many of the police officers. Many of them dads, the circumstance served as a poignant reminder of the difficulties that many families encounter. Particularly in lean economic times. What had started out as a domestic abuse inquiry had become a sobering depiction of the hard reality that marginalized people had to live with. Naturally, 
the two were freed and went back to their homes, their hearts brimming with affection for one another. But there was an unexpected surprise the following day. The knocks on the door kept waking them up. When they opened it, they saw something unexpected. A number of locals and the station's police officers were present. With a kind smile, Mary replied, I heard that someone here could use a little help. The sergeant went on, and by the way, we're in need of a janitor at the police station, before Roger had time to process his shock. Do you think that would be interesting? Roger felt tears welling up in his eyes. He was used to going it alone, so the kindness of these folks caught him off guard. I am at a loss for words. Yes, I do. In fact, agree. I am truly grateful, he responded, visibly moved. Henry, meantime, sprinted over, ecstatically welcoming the unexpected development. He yelled out, Look, Daddy, upon spotting the toys, take a look at all these toys. He looked down at the child's beaming face as he said this. And he wiped away his own tears. A joyous and unforgettable day was had by all. A week later, Roger would find himself working, finding solace, and symbolizing a new chapter in his life in the police station a location he had never even considered before. News of the small boy who had his father jailed quickly made its way across the city. It brought people together to aid the downtrodden, to make sure that no family remained hungry or without support. Volunteer groups started coordinating donation fairs and aid initiatives. Everything changed when a young boy's innocent act, driven by his love for his father, touched the lives of everyone in town. He showed everyone that even in the face of hardship, compassion and understanding can grow, and that honest deeds can have far-reaching consequences. After watching the first story above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. Now, let's watch another similar story. When the driver of the bus ridiculed a poor woman trying to board, a little boy on his way to school stood up for her. Her exact identity remained unknown until the next day, when a Mercedes pulled up to the boys' school on a gloomy and overcast morning. At the bus stop stood Arthur and his father, Robert. As they conversed, the crisp air imparted a peaceful calm to the busy city. Robert was especially careful that morning, giving his kid his last instructions because he couldn't go to school with him because of a crucial job interview. Please keep in mind what I taught you, Robert remarked sounding confident but yet worried. I have an interview today, so I won't be able to go with you. You need to get off at the stop near the school I showed you. Be careful in this big city, you don't want to get lost. With a beaming expression of self-assurance, the nine-year-old kid comforted his father. Dad, I am nine years old, he said, trying not to show his apprehension about going on his first solo trip. That he was a grown-up now. Robert caressed his son's hair tenderly, his eyes misting over with pride. It was a turning point in life. A tiny, symbolic farewell to youth, Robert stated, that's right, big man, attempting to maintain his composure. With a rumbling sound, the bus arrived, a huge, metal vehicle that gave the impression of swallowing passengers and then spitting them out. Robert said, look, the bus is here, when he assisted his kid in boarding. They gave each other a firm hug and agreed to meet again later that day. Arthur boarded, paid the fare, and gave the driver a bashful, good morning. As the bus departed, Robert's mind wavered between worry about his upcoming interview and optimism for his son's successful day. Arthur made the bus his personal cosmos by settling into a corner seat. Lost in his innocent reverie, he peered out the window to observe the people, the streets, and the drab sky. The city whizzed by, its colors subdued, engines and conversations humming. A seemingly ordinary day was going to turn into an adventure filled with challenges and discoveries. Arthur had no idea what surprises were in store for him when the bus traveled forward. His life was about to take a sudden shift, one of those infrequent occurrences that mold our destiny and character. He had no idea that his ability to empathize would be put to the test. A throng of people boarded the bus when it stopped at a busy station. One woman in particular stood out among the others. Her restless stare and worried face told me she was looking for something. Or someone. Anyone who glanced at her was moved by the intense anxiety and worry that was mirrored in her eyes. 
There was something somber about her that made her look out of place. She hadn't paid the fare, so the turnstile stopped her when it was her turn to board. She hesitated before telling the driver she was short on cash for the ticket. Her shocked and embarrassed tone could be heard in her trembling voice. The motorist, who was obviously having a rough day, became enraged. He spoke in a rude and brutal manner. What do you mean you have no money? Then, why are you even in this place? Leave now, leave my bus now. The harsh comments and rising voice of the driver reverberated throughout the car, causing the passengers to look on with curiosity and unease. The woman, clearly embarrassed, started pleading, explaining that she had to go to her destination and making an agonizingly real promise that she would come back to pay. She pleaded, Sir, I swear I'll come back to pay you. However, the driver persisted in throwing charges and unfounded criticism, which made her humiliation even worse. As if I'm going to give trash like you free rides on my bus with the expectation that you'll return to pay the fare. He yelled, I know you're kind very well, you're all scammers. The unfortunate woman's cheeks started to bleed when her tears traced pathways of anguish. As things became worse, the driver appeared ready to physically remove her from the bus. Ahead of time, he stood up, ready to seize her arm and fling her out. Arthur, whose uneasiness and outrage had been growing, finally lost control. He got to his feet, his diminutive frame brimming with resolve, when he noticed that nobody else was prepared to lend a hand. The lunch money, which he knew his father had worked so hard to obtain, he withdrew with a shaking hand. He was so excited to be able to get the pizza he wanted so badly from school, but never had the money for. Putting compassion ahead of his own goals was an easy decision for him to make. He walked up to the driver with purpose and reached out his hand to offer him the cash. Look at this, at last, she's free to board the bus, he declared with an air of confidence belying his youth. Anger at the driver's cruel treatment of the woman and pride in his own moral judgment led him to return to his seat. And he shot him an obscene glance before getting back in his seat. Not because he had lost his lunch money, but because he was acting so intensely. His small heart was racing. Not only did it make Arthur's day, but it also marked the beginning of his transformation into an exceptional young man. In spite of the gloomy morning, the bus persisted in its journey, transporting a tale of bravery and kindness. There was an air of shock and awe among the passengers after Arthur's courageous deed. Still taken aback by the child's boldness, the driver was rendered speechless. The boy's extraordinary demeanor was the subject of whispers and exchanged looks. With permission to proceed, the woman sat down next to her youthful rescuer. A fresh glimmer of relief and appreciation shone through the remnants of tears that lingered in her eyes. My voice is still shaking, but I am so grateful to you, my little friend, she murmured. Arthur, displaying an air of maturity well above his years, reached inside his bag and presented her with a handkerchief, suggesting that she use it to wipe her face. No worries, no one deserves to be treated that way, he responded plainly. Later. Arthur told the driver a story about his own experience with a situation when he and his father, Robert, were reprimanded, humiliated, and forced to get off the bus because Robert was short 10 cents. Arthur recounted the entire ordeal, including the long walk home. A mix of surprise and grief crossed the woman's face as she listened. After the boy was so sweet to her, she vowed she would do something to pay him back. While they conversed, the outer world went about its regular business. People boarded and alighted the bus as it chugged along, everyone engrossed with their own life and tales, oblivious to the random act of generosity unfolding within. Arthur and the woman had a short but profound chat. She smiled softly in response to his introduction. Arthur stepped off the bus at his stop, said farewell, and walked resolutely to school, with her heart still warmed by his noble act. The woman watched him through the window until he was gone. Arthur continued to go away, completely unaware of the consequences of his actions. While the woman stayed on the bus, fixated on him, her true identity remained a mystery to everyone present. Despite what the driver had said, she was more than just a disturbed individual, a destitute woman living on the streets, or a con artist. The driver and Arthur, in particular, 
would be filled with dread as they would learn her true identity and the terrifying events that would ensue. Without realizing how remarkable it would turn out to be, every person on the bus took a little bit of this narrative with them as they continued on their way. Feeling hungry, the boy spent the day at school daydreaming about the pizza he had wanted to get. He knew that was the correct thing to do, so even though he was hungry, he didn't regret it, he told his father the account of the bus when he got home. Robert listened intently, emotion and pride glimmering in his eyes. With a lovely yet melancholic voice, he said, your mother would be very proud of you. After giving his son a firm embrace, he took out his wallet and gave him ten dollars. Here, son, for you to buy that slice of pizza tomorrow, and there will still be some money left for the other days, his dad remarked. Arthur jumped with delight and gave him a heartfelt hug. Additionally, Robert said, you see, buddy, good things are always rewarded. Even though he knew the money was valuable, he made an effort to speak in a lighthearted and upbeat manner. They had no idea how enormous the prize that awaited them would be. Robert took Arthur to school the following day. Even though Robert was just 37 years old, he was regrettably told that he was deemed too old for the delivery guy position. He was saddened by this news and concerned about how he would provide for his son. Particularly at this point when he was in desperate need of employment. Robert had fallen into a deep and abiding sadness following the death of his wife. The next six years were difficult and unclear for his kid, who was just three years old at the time. In order to fully focus on parenting Arthur, Robert did odd jobs, dropped out of college, and gave up his automation engineering degree. After leaving the youngster off at school that morning, Robert proceeded to discuss his son's financial circumstances with the principal. Arthur was going to lose his scholarship to the private school. Robert was worried that he wouldn't be able to support his son through school if he didn't get a fresh scholarship or a steady job. A fancy Mercedes drove up in front of the school while Robert took care of money affairs and the young child settled into his classroom. The car's gates opened, and a calm person got out. It was the female from the previous day's bus. The woman, in all her beauty and mystery, attracted everyone's attention with her elegant attire, which stood in sharp contrast to the bleak impression she had given on the bus. Her demeanor oscillated between kindness and authority when she walked up to the reception desk. Eliciting stares of adoration and intrigue, there was a longing in her voice to get in touch with the lad who had shown her such unexpected generosity. And this was evident when she inquired about Arthur and his residence. It seemed sense that the school would be reluctant to give over any personal information to a stranger since it was guarding its children. But Robert's presence handling the money matters made things easier. That his father is present is fortunate. Would you like to speak with him? The worker acknowledged the significance of the request but stated, We are unable to provide you with any personal information about our children. Yes, give his father a call. The woman said, I'll be waiting, in a princess-like manner. Robert was escorted to her a few minutes later, his countenance both curious and concerned, his head whirled with surprise at seeing her, she was breathtaking, her beauty appearing to light up everything around her, Mr. Robert, this woman said your son helped her on the bus yesterday and wanted to speak with you, the receptionist said, Robert's heart beat from shock as much as memory of Arthur's account of the destitute woman on the bus, it made no sense, rather than the goddess in front of him, he had pictured a homeless lady. With a bow, she formally introduced herself. Excuse me, Robert. Hi, I'm Maggie, she said. Before going on to describe her time spent interacting with Arthur and how much she admired and thanked him. Each of her sentences bolstered Robert's parental pride, and her words were like music to his ears. Offering me a handkerchief and covering the cost of my ticket. He was truly a gentleman. She spoke with a voice betraying her emotions praising the small kid for his generous spirit. The two then departed from the reception and proceeded to converse in the school garden. A peaceful and inviting setting where the conversation flowed effortlessly. The woman expressed her desire to assist the young boy when they strolled together. The receptionist had told her about Robert and his son's predicament as she waited. And she expressed her profound sadness and the significance of education. Such bravery and generosity are so unusual these days. Peering into his eyes, she spoke these words, 
Your boy is incredibly exceptional. And you're a great father for raising him like this. Their lives were about to be turned upside down when Maggie extended an offer. For your son's education, I would be willing to pay. To some extent, it's my way of saying, thank you, for all the generosity he's shown me. As he tried to comprehend the magnitude of the gift and its implications for their future. Robert found himself rendered speechless. Startled, he attempted to decline. No, I'm not going to accept it. According to him, it's excessive. However, the woman was adamant, and her resolve shone through in all that she said. Look, I'm begging you, Robert, deservedly so. Finally, Robert gave in, his emotions and thankfulness taking over. He knelt on the turf of the garden and started to cry. His eyes watering, he mumbled, Thank you, thank you very much, with each syllable carrying a mixture of happiness and relief. In the midst of the blossoms and beneath the clear sky of that garden, an act of modesty had set in motion a cascade of compassion and optimism that would alter the course of their lives irrevocably. They were embraced by the tranquil school environment as they sat on a bench under a tree's shade. Word by word, Maggie's narrative unfolded into something more astonishing than fiction. August, a mogul of high end automobiles, had a daughter named Maggie. An attempted kidnapping had occurred the night before. Right before daylight, she detailed her miraculous escape from the automobile where she had been held captive, which she attributed to a combination of luck and sheer willpower. She hurried through the city, boarding the first bus she spotted, completely bereft of money and possessions, as she described the depths of misery she felt at that moment. Her voice quivered with terror and agony. Robert paid close attention while the woman spoke, his mental image of her evolving with each word. Arthur had bailed her out, and she had made a mental note of the school's location so that she could find a way to reciprocate his goodwill. She was able to contact her father, who quickly came to her aid, after she climbed out of the car with the assistance of a kind passerby. She was finally safe after the city's security cameras helped apprehend her kidnappers. The story thrilled Robert while simultaneously perplexing him. A deep and significant connection had been formed between his son's life and this woman through a complicated and surprising web that fate had spun. As they conversed, the young lad emerged into the playground, where he discovered his dad and Maggie. Seeing her brought a smile to his face, a mix of astonishment and delight. He said, Hey, you're the bus girl. Arthur still couldn't believe his efforts had rescued her after hearing the whole story. After much anticipation, Maggie finally got him a pizza by inviting them to a restaurant. She was charmed by Arthur's innocence and gladness, and she chuckled as he bounced with joy. A true bond of friendship developed between them as time went on. Arthur and Robert's lives were brightened by Maggie's frequent visits, which brought a new feeling of belonging and happiness. She found out that Robert had put his studies on hold to help out with his son and himself, which strengthened their relationship and made their lives better. After she spoke with her father, he was given the opportunity to finish his education and work as an engineer for the high-end automobile manufacturer. The dad and his son's lives underwent a profound and unthinkable transformation as a result of this opportunity. Their lives were ultimately completely changed by what began as a straightforward act of kindness on a bus. Robert and Maggie eventually fell in love, and Arthur was granted the mother he had always desired. They became a family, bound together by love and the knowledge that compassion and generosity can have a great impact. Their narrative showed how one deed of kindness may set off a chain reaction of transformation. Changing people's lives and touching hearts. A little boy on a bus had a kind heart, and it turned one family's life around to one of joy and love. After watching the stories above, do you have any thoughts? Feel free to share your opinions in the comments section. If you enjoyed our video, please like, subscribe, and share our channel. That all about today's stories. See you next time.